This video was brought to you by Imprint. China's economy isn't having a good time at the moment. Despite the CCP announcing a series of stimulus measures last week, China's economic prospects haven't really improved. And just in the last month, China's shadow banking sector, including opaque financial institutions like trusts, have started showing worrying signs of strain. This is particularly concerning for the CCP, because shadow banks lend money all over the place, so stress here could easily leak out into the rest of the economy. In this video then, we're going to explain what shadow banking is, why China's shadow banking industry is literally the biggest in the developing world, and why this could make China's pre-existing economic crisis a whole lot worse. Before we start, if you want more information and analysis from TLDR, then we just announced our 28-page newspaper that summarizes all of 2023. There's a link to the announcement video and the store in the description. And pre-orders close on October 1st. So to understand this story, you're going to need to understand what shadow banking is. Basically, states like to have control over their money supply in order to make sure the amount of money in the system matches or nearly matches the amount of goods and services being produced. Otherwise, if there's not enough money in the system, as happened when a lot of people used gold for money, when more stuff gets produced, you end up with deflation, i.e. the value of money starts going up, which encourages people to hoard money and cripple the economy. Conversely, if there's too much money in the system, even if people are producing loads of stuff, you still get high levels of inflation, i.e. the value of money starts rapidly declining, which encourages people to spend more recklessly and undermines money's role as a store of value and as a medium of exchange. And to prevent this from happening, states have banks which are essentially responsible for creating money and thereby controlling the amount of money in the system, and which are regulated and supported by the state. In doing this, states try and create a distinction between banks and other financial institutions, or more specifically, a distinction between deposits, which are when you invest money into a bank, and investments, which are when you give it to a non-bank financial institutions. Deposits are money, you can withdraw them as cash whenever you like, and they feel risk-free, because you trust that the state will make sure that inflation won't eat away at your savings, and you trust the central bank or state-employed supervisors to make sure that your bank doesn't go bankrupt. Investments are different though. You can't just withdraw money whenever you feel like it, and they're risky because your financial institution of choice might go bankrupt. Essentially, investments aren't money-like, which is why you don't consider yourself an investor in your bank. Anyway, sometimes non-banks pretend to be banks by promising their investors that their investments are super safe and can be withdrawn at any time. And these entities are often known as shadow banks. A good example of this today might be stablecoin issuers, who claim that their cryptocurrencies are as good as dollars. But... As anyone who invested in Terra Luna will know, they're often not. Anyway, like many countries, China has a lot of shadow banks. Actually, China has more shadow banks than most other similarly developed countries because of the CCP's ambiguity over what sorts of banks it would support. In the past, the CCP has played a conspicuously activist role in China's financial system, intervening to prop up systemically important banks. In turn, this has encouraged Chinese citizens and investors to move their money out of Chinese banks and into unregulated shadow banks, because they offer better interest rates and many Chinese investors assume that they are essentially backstopped by the CCP anyway. This is why, according to analysis by Peking University in 2019, as much as 40% of all Chinese debt is owed to shadow banks. In fact, shadow banks have been issuing more debt than actual banks since about 2009. And the IMF estimates that China has a larger shadow banking sector relative to GDP than most developed economies and basically any other developing economy. Now, while shadow banks can sometimes help an economy grow, especially if normal banks aren't doing enough lending, in China, they've helped to create the current crisis by directing more money into speculative assets like property and risky assets like the pre-sale houses offered by Evergrande. 
This happens because shadow banks want higher returns in order to convince their investors to use them instead of normal banks. And because they're not regulated like normal banks, they find it easier to invest in risky assets, which might be banned for normal banks. Now, the CCP know this, which is why they've been trying to crack down on the shadow banking industry since about 2017. And they even criminalized loans with an annual interest rate of above 36% in 2019. But not much has changed since then. While most analysts think that the shadow banking sector has actually shrunk somewhat since then, it's still one of the largest in the world, and it's struggling to cope with China's current economic slowdown. In fact, as well as helping to create the crisis, China's shadow banks are now also accelerating it. Because they're over-leveraged and opaque, China's shadow banks are both more likely to collapse and harder to rescue. Perhaps the most common form of non-banks in China are trusts, which are essentially companies that take money from people and use fancy financial instruments to lend it to property developers and local governments. Trusts are a massive industry in China, worth something like $2.9 trillion all in all. And the biggest trusts have hundreds of billions of yuan under management. During China's boom years, most trusts promised returns of 10% or more, which is why so many people dumped so much money into them. However, as property developers and local governments go bust across China, they've started taking trusts down with them. The first to go was Jin Hua, a relatively small trust which went bankrupt in May, and the first trust to go bankrupt in China for more than two decades. Since then, however, numerous other trusts have shown signs of stress, including Zhong Grong, one of the largest trusts in China, which missed client payments in mid-August. But the real test for these trusts will come in December, when they're due to pay out something like 700 billion yuan to investors. If more defaults occur then, investors might decide to withdraw all of their funds, sparking a sort of shadow bank run. And this is something that the CCP ought to be particularly worried about, because thanks to their opaque lending practices and the fact that they invest in a whole range of stuff, there's a high risk of contagion. I.e. there's a good chance that turmoil in the trust industry could spill out into other parts of China's economy. Ultimately, this is the classic problem with shadow banking. Shadow banking is hard to ban outright, and financial services regulation can sometimes feel like a futile game of whack-a-mole. And there's a real temptation to not even bother trying, because these shadow banks can accelerate growth in a country, at least in boom times, by directing credit to corners of the economy that traditional banking can't reach. However, in a downturn, shadow banks become a particularly acute risk, too big to ignore, but too vulnerable and difficult to fix. If you're interested in this kind of thing, you might enjoy Imprint's Visual Guide to the 48 Rules of Power, a book that's been described as an amoral, ruthless, and instructive guide for those interested in understanding and gaining power. But that's not the only thing you can learn. Just like TLDR, Imprint is all about helping you learn quickly, conveniently, and visually. It's super quick because most of their lessons take less than two minutes to complete, summarizing knowledge from all kinds of topics and using Harvard professors and best-selling authors to teach you key concepts. It's convenient because it's all housed in their easy-to-use mobile app, letting you replace doom scrolling with actual learning. And it's visual because, well, look at it. Their animated explanations help you stay focused, understand concepts quickly, and actually retain what you learn. So join the millions of users learning with Imprint, including me. I'm taking their multi-day flow course right now. And do that by using the link in the description. Plus, if you use that link, you'll get a seven-day free trial and get 20% of an annual plan when you sign up. And they'll know that you came from us. So check out Imprint, support our new sponsor, and thanks for watching TLDR.